Hyatt and welcome to the Mary Hyatt show. I am super excited about today's episode, which is episode number 55 with my very special guest, Tracy Brown. Oh my gosh, we get into the ins and outs of what it looks like to go through the messy process of learning how to trust your body as you are learning how to intuitively eat and sometimes where that can go wrong and what it looks like to actually get into the ins and outs of how you think about your body, how you think about food, how you think about what it means to be somebody who's in a thinner body or a fat body in this culture and how to continually dissect yourself and disconnect yourself from just the intensity of diet culture. So I'm going to introduce Tracy here in just a minute and have you listen to the interview with her. But before I do that, I want to make sure that you know about my upcoming workshop happening November 10th here in Nashville, Tennessee. I am so excited about this. It's going to be a beautiful, intimate Saturday from 10 until 3 where we are looking at body awareness. I'm going to be with you for those five hours connecting you with your body. And for those of you who know a little bit about my journey and my process to make peace with my body, make peace with food, to really get to the place where I can live fully alive, the missing link that I see for most everybody is the body, connecting the mind with the body. And so to me, we have to go beyond just therapy or just coaching, which of course I'm a huge fan of, but how do we get back into our bodies to continue the self-awareness, the self-development, the self-healing work journey that we are all on. So during this day, I'm going to teach you how to do that, how to connect with your body, how to feel your body sensations, how to learn your body's unique language and how to interpret that. I'm also going to go through a lot of different techniques on how you can relax your body enough to release anxiety, stress, pain, and trauma. I'm going to teach you how the body traps and stores emotions and what you can do to release that, what each part of your body emotionally represents. And so it's just going to be a powerful interactive day. We're going to have some lecture. We're going to have some experimental work. I'm going to walk you through some mindfulness practices, some breath work, some gentle movement. So it's really interactive to get us inside of our bodies and ultimately help you to make peace with the relationship with your body. So I hope you will consider joining me for this intimate workshop. It's gonna be a beautiful day in the studio here in the heart of Nashville with just 20 people. So we are getting close to selling out and the early bird pricing is going back up to normal pricing after October 20th. So right now it's only $75 for the whole day, lunch is included, and after October 20th, the price goes up to $97. So if you are considering this, if you wanna come with a a daughter or a girlfriend, make a weekend out of it, definitely check that out at maryhyatt.com forward slash workshop, where I go into all the details of the actual workshop day itself. So maryhyatt.com forward slash workshop. But without further ado, let me introduce to you our very special guest today, Tracy Brown. Tracy is a RD. She is a somatic nutrition therapist and dietitian, a tuned eating coach, and embodiment teacher. She helps people come home to themselves through their bodies by healing their relationship with food and weight, as well as feeling safer and less stress in their bodies. So for 12 years, Tracy has guided people one-on-one and in group in healing from disordered eating and chronic dieting, many of which have had PCOS and other stress-related conditions. And you can find Tracy at tracybrownrd.com, which will also be in the show notes, so you can make sure to check her out. She's on Facebook, where she often does a lot of different Facebook Lives, where she will talk about all of these principles, sort of breaking down intuitive eating and helping you implement this when it feels like it gets stuck and it gets messy. She's also on Instagram, she is on YouTube, but Tracy really 
brings to the table. Uh, just a genuine energy. I think you're really going to hear that in today's interview. She's very compassionate. She's very sincere. She just has this passion about her that uh, just allows you to feel like you can get through this diet culture craziness that we as women are often facing. And she really helps walk you through not only how to stop dieting and binging and hating your body, but she really teaches you how to be compassionate with yourself through the process of living more fully, even when life is challenging, when things are getting tough, how to sort of approach that with loving compassion. So I think you're going to find that certainly Tracy and I are talking the same language. And I think you're going to get some insight into this body journey that maybe you haven't had before. So without further ado, here is my interview with Tracy. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Mary Hyatt Show. I am so excited about my very special guest today, Tracy Brown. As you heard just a few moments ago, she is just a wealth of knowledge, and we've already had a chance to talk a little bit before the show, and I know that today's conversation is going to be so powerful for those of you who are on this journey of learning how to trust your body, trust your body specifically around food, and learning how to feel more safe around this whole eating process in a culture that pretty much tells us that we cannot trust ourselves or our body. So welcome to the show, Tracy. I'm just so excited to have you here today. Oh, Mary, I'm so, I guess I'm so honored. I'm a fan of yours and I'm honored to be here to help, you know, your folks just have probably a reiteration from what you talk about a lot with them, but also, um, you know, from a different language and hopefully some for some great depth. So I'm happy to be here. I just, uh, I feel like you have an experience, obviously, that I don't have, where you get to work with a lot of different clients and patients. So you sort of have in the field experience where you are seeing sort of the intuitive eating play out from person to person. And as we were talking about in the pre-show, I know one of the things that you've experienced a lot is people who have practiced intuitive eating, but fast forward several years down the road, and they're still sort of in this cycle of diet mentality, of binging or of trying to find the next diet. And I think for a lot of people, the idea of intuitive eating sounds really awesome. You know, getting to the place where you can eat anything that you want, where you've made peace with food, and you really learn how to feel your hunger and you feel your fullness. But I think somewhere along the line, somewhere down the road, there ends up being a breakdown and of information where people aren't really able to assimilate it into their everyday life. So I'm curious, just from sort of a research perspective for you, where do you see this happening with your clients? Like, where do you see the breakdown occurring as people are coming to you and saying, hey, intuitive eating doesn't really work. I can't figure it out. Right. Well, I think um, it has to go actually way back into our own, or possibly our patterns even prior before losing track of our own hunger and fullness, or maybe even it's possible even before our first diet or that first, those, those first kind of patterns we gain if we're doing some sneak eating or, or hiding eating, you know, from our friends or our parents or family or whatever. So this can go way back. And for some people, yeah, they can just, um, who have a lot of inner, like a, a strong inner platform to, um, you know, know how they feel and know what's, it's almost like, okay, I know how I feel. It's just like diet culture got me kind of off track for myself. And I, don't, I have forgotten how to trust myself. So that's one population of people I work with. And really I work with them, you know, several months or maybe even a year and they're good. They're good to go. And then I have this population that um, and I was one of those as well in my own journey that, okay, so um, that sounds great. I'll stop dieting. And I'll stop, you know, work on my food rules and all the good or the good food, bad food, you know, kind of make peace with all that and even possibly make peace with my body. But really, I didn't know how to truly fully be in my body without a lot of sensations and feelings of discomfort. So that was causing like this bobbing in and out. And 
I would call that basically we've been disembodied. And that happens, um, well, diet culture teaches that. Diet culture off the bat. So that's just part of the gig to get you sucked in is you are up in your head and you can't trust anything below the neck. Um, but we could have had things prior to that to set the stage for it much more easily. Well, you know, it's so interesting and I'm so glad you're bringing this up because when I did my course last year, Babe Redefined, I had a, a beta group and I was asking them when we were talking about what to name the course, kind of the, one of the taglines that I had was coming home to your body. Mm -hmm. And for me, that sounded really lovely. You know, it sounded really nice to come home to your body because I felt so disconnected from my body, a little bit of an out of body experience where I was sort of a walking brain and didn't really have body sensations and couldn't connect to my body. So the idea of coming home to my body where I was able to slow down and feel fullness, feel hunger, feel my emotions was really appealing to me. But almost unanimously across the board, everybody said, no, 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 no. Coming home to your body is actually really threatening. Like yes. they, they took that as a really negative kind of, of phrase where I was interpreting it as really peaceful. They were interpreting it as a place of fear, a place that didn't feel safe. Like coming back to their home was scary. Their body as home was really scary. It was, and so I'm curious, it sounds like that's a little bit what you're talking about, that people are interpreting the body as sort of a war zone where pain resides or trauma resides or something like that. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's a hundred percent what it is. Um, that I use that same phrasing and so, and a lot of my posts and a lot of things I do too. And for some people, that's the reaction. Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be great to just be solid in myself and whew, have relief? Or it's like, that sounds great, but it doesn't, my body doesn't feel like a great place to be, or it's confusing, or it's conflicting, or um, I, I just, there's just so much uncertainty that I don't know what to trust. You know, so that's what a lot of my clients that have come to me who, you know, kind of work on intuitive eating maybe for a while and they start to feel like, okay, well, is this actual real fullness? And they get scared that let's say, here's an example, like I'll have a client who is feeling like, I think I'm eating from hunger and fullness, but why is my body changing? I don't trust what's happening. And the default is like, well, I have to fix this with weight loss then. Intuitive eating doesn't work when really it's like, what? what truly are these signals and do I have any like um, prohibition to like it being okay to stop when I'm full or does full like solid, like, okay, I'm good. I'm done. Does that not feel safe enough? Do you have to really know you're full by being like stopped and then you feel okay, but there's a conflict, right? Because you don't want to feel so stuffed that you, don't feel good, but that's what you're used to is to something that feels safe. Well, and I, and I love that concept of just interpret, interpreting individually what fullness is because for some, and I would imagine if you've existed in diet culture as well for a really long time, fullness can jump to, you know, A plus B equals C. If I'm full, that must mean I'm overeating, which right. must mean that I'm fat. Right. And so even the, the sensation, the physical, biological sensation of feeling full is threatening because we think that, especially people who are, who've lived in thinner bodies and struggle with eating disorders like anorexia, for example, or bulimia, fullness in a way is, an, is the enemy. And so feeling truly satisfied when you're so used to deprivation is very threatening. And so to just kind of say, okay, yes, the goal is to feel full. And for people who struggle with anorexia or bulimia, that is sort of moving the needle more to the right side, where if you're moving from, you know, emotionally overeating or eating beyond your level of full, you're kind of trying to move the needle back the other way a little bit and saying, hey, let's not get to the place where you're physically hurting from eating, but you can kind of stop at that level where you're satisfied and where you're full. But I just, I just imagine like that's got to feel threatening sometimes. Even the idea, the, the symbolism we, we put around mm -hmm. the word full to be right. full, even as a full woman, like what does that look like to be a full, you know, full figured woman, fullness, big present, 
vocal, loud, I mean, all the kind of cultural stigmas on, you know, being too much as a woman, we can equate that with being full as well. So there's a psychological element here too. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you combat that with your, with your clients? How do you walk them through the process? You know, I'm glad you asked that question because it's, we have to unpack, unpack every meal, And what is, you know, what is the, what is your best like thumb on like, what's the biological hunger and fullness? And then either what's, what's that mean either? What do you think that means about you or to you? Or what's the belief system about that? And then, or it could be, even if let's say you got like this just right spot you ate and then, you know, what does that feel like to get that? So we're really just unpacking like, okay, what does that mean to get it satisfied? or to not be satisfied. And the answers always kind of tell you of like, Oh, here's the block. It's not so much like, you know, some people are cool with like stopping at like comfortable fullness. Some people that feel scary, either approaching it, um, stopping at it and, and vice versa, the other end, like, okay, I never really get full. I just get to where I'm surviving. And that's their home note. And that's their main gear. And, knowing what purpose that serves. So when we get there, it's not just about like, here's what I feel biologically, like physically, um, you know, how big or small is the emotional hunger and fullness. And um, if, if the, like your adult, like rational self is like, gosh, I don't want to keep doing this. And I feel terrible, but I keep doing this. You know, there's some payoff in some part of us. There's some adaptive function for it at, at some level of us. And we're just trying to help people or I'm just trying to help people find what that is with no judgment, total compassion, because it was survival. Definitely. At some point, like if you're in diet culture, you diet for survival, not because, Oh, this is a party. (laughs) You feel like you have to, to like earn love, respect, worth, whatever. Um, Or it's, you know, I kind of want to stay little and small because that's what survival is for me. Um, Whatever, you know, again, whatever, um, it's almost like, you know, any kind of food behaviors are um, a container for whatever the story is of, of, of a wound usually. And so our job is to decode that and pack it, unpack it and all that. Talk to me more about that a little bit. Like if that, if the way we eat is maybe a mirror of how mm-hmm. we're processing life, talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, you kind of touched on it as far as the element of survival, but I don't know if you have been able to put language to that more, but I think that's really fascinating and it's not anything oh, that I've yeah. ever talked about on the show before. So I would love for you to go into that a little bit. Like what does that mirror look like? Like maybe some examples of that or something would be helpful. Yeah. yeah, Mary. So you're like one step ahead of me in this conversation. It's totally what's happening on your plate might be happening in your life. So let's say I have a, a, a client who's struggling with you look at their food and it looks kind of okay, but then I'll literally like you put, you imagine putting that amount of food in their hand and it's, it's so small and it's almost like this, let's say the smallest of like the, the meals and snacks. Um, it's kind of like a get, but I said that their food is like nearing I'm getting by. I'm not starving, but I'm getting by. And I just pretty much, ah, and they'll, they, sometimes when you start to use that language, if they're, if they've been with me a while, they can kind of see like, Oh, well, this looks like my life. I'm just surviving my day because I hate my job and I don't want to be where I am at. I'm not living out what I thought I would do. And I'm just surviving this life that I feel like, well, I chose this. So I'm dealing with it now versus, well, maybe that's what you're dealing with and you don't have a solution yet, but really where can you put your stake in the ground that you don't really totally have to be so small and get by with so little to like survive or to figure this out. That's one example. It's so fascinating. So what I love about talking to you is that, you know, you've traditionally for most of your life, you've lived in a a smaller body. Is that like a thin body? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And for people who know my story, I, for most of my adult life have lived in in a larger body. And, and so hearing you talk about that, where my mind goes is this is such a helpful perspective from somebody who experiences diet culture from a thin body. So for me, the way that my plate mirrored my life was I was so shut down emotionally and would not take care of myself, did not give myself 
any kind of self care that my plate ended up being the kind of the pendulum would swing on the opposite end and I would have to make up for the deficit that I was feeling mm -hmm. in my life with mm -hmm. food on my plate. So it was like the one area where I would quote unquote give to myself. And so because I wasn't doing that in my normal everyday life, what that looked like is a lot of overeating. I was trying to compensate for mm -hmm. the ways in my life that I felt, um, unloved or inadequate or whatever. It was, there was no piece of deprivation on my plate, but I was sort of trying to fill up this psychological hunger that I was feeling in my life. Whereas for you, when you're talking about this idea of smaller portions or, or maybe on the other end of the spectrum where you're not eating or nourishing yourself in the way that your brain needs to be able to function at an optimal level and to be in a state of thriving versus just surviving, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about what it's like to recover from diet culture, being somebody who's been in a thin body versus maybe what I would share about it looking um, a certain way because of living in a larger body. So can you kind of speak to the population? Yeah. They've never had a weight problem. They've never struggled with their actual weight, but it's more, maybe more mental or emotional. Well, I think it's all, like I said, mental and emotional. It's just that there's, you know, within privilege, there's a little bit of um, a pass, you know, for unless you get too thin, then there's a problem, right? But um, I do want to make sure that I recognize that, and most of my clients come from this perspective of I, every person I've ever worked with, there's definitely, like you're describing, like a always a threat of deprivation, always. And it could feel more like it's, even if there's not a lot of like tangible deprivation, there's still like, I don't feel like I deserve to truly have what I want. And you might diet, you might not, and it might come out through deprivation driven eating or not. But I just want to share with you that um, I, I, I do not like this term at all. I think it's super, again, another medicalization of body size, but there's a this term called um, atypical anorexia where it's like, okay, you fit all the criteria except that you're not thin. So I just want to put that out there to you that if you're not identifying as being thin, but if I identify with some of the story, then your experience is, 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 is <laughs> it's really happening for you too. It's just your body's not matching what people think it should to like have those struggles. So just putting it out there. Um, so that's really important to me because, um, you know, just people suffer so much of not being seen with that. So mm, thank um, you for that. I want to share that, but so recovery. Okay. So it's interesting. I tell my clients that like, well, everybody loses in a fat phobic thin obsessed culture. It's just that if you're in a thinner body and you believe in diet, the, the rules of diet culture, you believe that like you still have all this control over your body size. And if you just tried hard enough, you know, you'd be, you could either prevent a larger size from happening or you are. So you're the one that's making your thinner size happen, you know? So it's very, again, convoluted, but um, so you either have that, or if you're in a larger body, then you have to deal with the, the garbage that comes with being in a larger body um, and what people may or may think about your health or whatever. But so that being said, it's, there's definitely still a lot of distortion and a disconnect between like um, when you're, what you, what you know to be true is that like when you recover, you're going to gain weight and you know, to a certain level, people might be relieved by that, but there's always a place where like, we'll gain weight, but not too much. So there's, there's that <laughs> you, you have to deal with. Yeah. But, um, but I think, and especially if you're not lucky enough to be in a situation where people support whatever you need to do with it, which is like, yeah, if you need to eat all the foods. Cause I see a lot of people like, well, help them gain weight, but not too much. And it'd be healthy, you know? So there's still that bind of like, oh, well, I can't just eat and learn how to eat and recover. I've got to do it a certain way. So there's, those are all the things that come up unless you're lucky enough to work with very non-diet body trusting people as well as have support in that way. But um, I think most of my clients recognize that like they, it's scary to let go of the kind of thinness in your back pocket just in case bad things happen again, or you can't handle something because it's like, you're kind of given up um, one, an automatic way in this culture to get acceptance and approval. So you're kind of choosing to like let go of privilege 
in a lot of ways. Even though you might still have it and you might not know you have it when you get there, there's a level of like, oh, when I let go of really being able to do this thing, I, if I really let go of it, I'm not going to have that um, available to me if I want to fully be done with this, basically. So there's, that's really scary. And um, I, think, I think it's scary, actually, for all of us, no, so all sizes included, to be somebody that's kind of like, it changes you forever. You're always kind of like an upstream, swimming upstream kind of person in terms of like having different beliefs around food and health and weight and how you see people and how you see how people treat each other. And it's just seen as normal, you know, like coming up to somebody, oh, you've lost weight, you look so great. You know, you're not going to say, oh, well, this is the cancer or diet or this is the divorce diet. Right. You know, one, of my, one of my biggest pet peeves in conversation is that right there is, oh my gosh, I had that. It's happened recently to me. You look so amazing. Have you lost some weight? And I'm like, girl, you've got no idea what this weight loss is from, <laughs> you know, like all this, right. stress. this is not, this is not a healthy situation, you know, but just like you said, the assumption that if you're thinner, you must be healthier. Right. If you're thinner, that's better. Let's praise you for this weight loss without having any clue as to how that was obtained or mm -hmm. anything. And I love what you're talking about. I think this is probably going to be a new term for a lot of my audience is the idea, this concept called thin privilege. So when you say thin privilege, I mean, I think we kind of get what that means, but if you could just quantify it a little bit. Yeah. Putting a thin body well, see, like I would say that like when I when I started to like get really you know, deeper into my own work that I recognize like, Oh, you know, even if I gain 20 or 30 pounds, I'm still going to be in a smaller body. If I gain 50 pounds, I'm still going to be in a smaller body. I understood that once I started again, get deeper into my own work and work on my own, like what's the function of all this restriction and binging. Cause I binge too, over exercising. All the things were is like, Oh, I, you know, you start to see like we're using, um, we just use this idea that and is a way to be safe, to be acceptable. Um, and I recognize like, yeah, I kind of knew, I just looked at my family history, looked at all the people. I started to do like this genealogy body map, you know, and I'm like, probably the probability is that I'm not going to be a large person once I fully recover. I knew that at some point I recognized that I still had fear. I think it was more emotional after that, of like leaving behind this tool um, and being different in this culture of like, you know, kind of having a stand on something and feeling strongly about something and knowing I can never go back and I can't connect with other people in a body bashing kind of way or in a using fitness to change the body kind of way or talking about food in a negative way that that ship had sailed if I was going to be free, you know? Um, but I just knew I wasn't going to probably be in a bigger body um, you know, I experienced tons of body hatred, tons of self hatred. So I don't know if that's less than somebody in a bigger body. Um, but it's just different. It's just different because I can be recovered and people aren't gonna like negatively see me based on my body size. That's just how it is. You know, so, so I walk around like in life that way and people, you could see, especially when I was restricting and binging. You know, I was eating rolls of cookie dough a day. I wasn't going to get a health lecture because nobody thought they could see it. Mm. That's the privilege. Like, I'm not going to get crap for my eating habits if they're not super nutrient dense because I'm thin. Right. Which is just goes to show you how broken the system is. And I think that's one of the things that for somebody who's lived in a larger body for a long time and somebody who's an advocate of, you know, acceptance of, of all body types. I know you are as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's important though for people in larger bodies to recognize that concept of thin privilege and to sort of disconnect from that as well. Because I think what happens is, is when we buy, when, when people in larger bodies buy into thin privilege, that's where I think it creates a lot of the, the dysfunction as far as in that loop of diet culture, because we yeah. think that if we could just get thin every problem that we've ever had would be mm -hmm. solved. Mm -hmm. Then I could do X, Y, Z. Then so-and-so would be attracted to me. Then I would be happy. Then I would be healthy. And I think it's really important to realize how much of that is an illusion. And yes, our culture obviously does 
put a lot of value towards that. I think when you're looking at it from a physical health perspective and a mental emotional health perspective, living in a thinner body is not going to equal physical or emotional or mental health. And I think that it's important to sort of put ourselves on an equal playing field as women Mm -hmm. (laughs) because Mm -hmm. sort of like we all are dealing with these same core problems that's just they're showing up in different ways and I think if we're not careful people in larger bodies can feel a real strong resentment towards other women and and thin bodies which to me creates more disconnection buying into the 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 lies of diet culture and sort of feeds the beast and so I think that if we can sort of call it what it is and say okay this is a privilege that isn't based on reality it gives us the opportunity to see it and approach it in a new way um, and hopefully find some camaraderie as women and move outside of the sphere of, of diet culture. But it's, yeah. it's tricky. It's tricky. And so from my perspective, you know, I've seen clients of all shapes and sizes for 12 plus years now is that I jump on the, I, the thing, the, the fact that, yeah, I'm in the room. I have a thinner body. I feel recovered and I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes. However, I love you and I have empathy and I want to help you find your peace too. So, um, and you don't, I just don't buy into the hype. I don't think I'm special because I'm a thinner body. My, I've had a lot in all, I mean, I'm trying to think, I mean, I don't share all my deep, dark, icky traumas with everybody, but, um, and I have my clients think back, you know, you've had a smaller body and I didn't prevent all the ick. Right. It had nothing to do with your body size. And I'm so like, deeply, deeply sorry for all those things. But I think there's, there's this coupling here and this misassociation that if you got smaller, that it wouldn't have happened or that at least you could have thinness now. And like now people will be okay with you. And I think that it's just like, can you go backwards in time and see how you were all different body sizes and sometimes life was good. And sometimes it was awful and your body size didn't necessarily cause that to happen now can people who have in our larger bodies be treated poorly because of that totally and that's an icky thing that happens but that's not i think it's awful that that's become something you have to deal with but it's not your fault and it's not your problem well totally and i think that realizing that happiness is not a guarantee when you are are in a thin body. And I think that was a certainly a misperception that I had. If I could just lose weight, then I would be happy. I mean, it really felt like that would, that was the thing that would shift everything in reality. And you know this, Mm -hmm. and I work with clients, my coaching clients Mm -hmm. and know this now it's Mm -hmm. like the weight is never the issue. That's never, that's never, never the the core of what's going on. And so if you're unhappy now and you lose 50 pounds, you're going to be unhappy 50 pounds lighter if you're not addressing what's making you unhappy in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that's just so important. And I love that your work includes diving deeper into the more of the root and not the symptom of what's actually. Well, yeah, well that's, you know, we talked about embodiment. Um, There are, I mean, I think that most people who do kind of work we do, we do get that, but it seems like you and I are both very vocal about like, I'm not really, being free from, from dieting or uh, an eating disorder isn't um, absence of symptoms. It's like you're embodied. Like you don't have that like drive in you to like, oh, I feel uncomfortable. It's my body. It's like I feel uncomfortable. And what do I need? And here's my food over here, like either nourishing me or, or it's just the best I have available or it's pleasurable or whatever it is, but it's not, it's, it's been disconnected. Like that loop of, you know, my food and my body is looped up with bad things. So I can't possibly like get satisfied or have pleasure or, um, or let go of this restricting or binging because, um, that's who I am or that's what has to protect me. It's, um, it's what I do to mask what's really going on. Yeah. It's like we get to the, um, we have to get embodied, which is why I take so much time through people's food experiences and it opens up the door to like what really is underneath that. It's like, you know, usually lack of safety, lack of knowing where you stand, um, dealing with like my internal environment, that the baseline is uncertainty with care. Mm. My, you're my baseline in this, coming in this world or in the first several years of my life or my whole life is 
sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. And that's my, that's how my system's wired. And so our job is to embody, you know, build a new neural pathways of like, oh, I know how to slow down and it feels safe enough for me to locate what I need and consistently give that to myself. That's embodiment. So you don't even have the head chatter anymore. It's just like, oh, here's the info. And, you know, that's what I like or I don't like. And I can stand my ground with that or I need to make changes. And we're not any longer talking about, like, what's the best diet? Because it's just not on the radar anymore. Well, and I think that, you know, practical way of looking at that, I was just talking about this on my last episode about numbing and what we do Mm -hmm. to numb when we are feeling uncomfortable and when we're experiencing uncomfortable emotion, which if you're a human being, that's at least 50% (laughs) of the time, you know, you're having emotions of fear or anxiety or stress or discomfort. And so I think when I hear you say embodiment, what that means to me is being present with Mm -hmm. that emotion where you're actually feeling it. You're feeling the sensations in your body. You're slowing down enough to be able to maybe even name that emotion or recognize that you're feeling it in the first place rather than, I think we talked about this. I think it's so brilliant. You said that so oftentimes when people are feeling an uncomfortable emotion, they immediately say, it's because I'm fat or I feel Mm -hmm. fat. Mm-hmm. As if that's kind of the one word that they use to encapsulate all the negative emotions they might be experiencing. They sort of throw it on the fat and then it goes into hyper control. Well, where's the next diet? How can I control and get out of mm-hmm. this feeling of mm-hmm. fat? Where in your experience, when people say, I, I feel fat, which is actually not possible, right? Like you can't, mm-hmm. it's not an emotion. Fat is not an right. emotion. <laughs> um, if I feel fat, like where, what is the actual emotion that people are usually mm. feeling when they say I feel fat? Uh, so I'm rubbing my hands together because this is at the heart. This is just one of many exercises I do with clients is when people say I feel fat, like you said, it's not like it's happy, mad, sad, or afraid. Now we can have beliefs or opinions about our body size, but that's, those are thoughts. So I feel fat is like saying I feel desk, you know, or I feel you know, a uh, chair, whatever. Um, but what has gotten looped up is, you know, if we think about in our culture, the, 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 the stereotypes and the value judgments are thin is good and fat is bad. So what we're saying is when we say I feel fat, we've gotten all coupled up the language of food and body with um, this value judgment around this emotion. So instead of saying I feel sad or I feel mad, or I feel um, too much, we make it my body's too much. I feel fat. And so we go on the, it's like, imagine like this little um, fork in the road. And so the bottom is, I feel fat at the fork of the road is like, really what we want to learn to name this experience is I feel uncomfortable. So we can uncouple it from like body size and just say, yeah, I feel uncomfortable. Cause well, if you believe you're fat and you don't like fat, that's going to make you uncomfortable. And so on the left hand side is well, diet culture gives us lots of ways to try to fix anything that we feel like, right, you know, and deeper a couple that with body size so it's like oh you feel fat okay well xyz diet restrict binge purge weigh yourself constantly track everything on and on and on and that will that will fix everything that's the marketing on the other side if we can hang out with i feel uncomfortable just a couple more seconds each time we feel it and then grow that capacity then the uncoupling and the problem solving is to happen which is okay, so what do I need to do here? I can problem solve. I can reach out. I can, oh, I feel instead of, I I feel uncomfortable because, and if you can look back over, was that moment of I feel fat? Was that just like 10 minutes ago? Has that been lingering for a week and I've been ignoring it? Like what's been going on that if fat's not the problem, what's been making me feel uncomfortable? And just start to kind of, if you can name it, great. Sometimes if you can't name it, if you're early on, it's like, well, I don't really know. I just feel really buzzy and feel like I can't stop. And um, I feel really worried, but I'm not sure about what. That's a great start. Just start there. Mm. (laughs) Um, And then you can grow again your capacity for like, well, when I feel this buzziness, like what have I done in the past or the, the present to help that? And you start to problem solve maybe what your needs are. Maybe you just need to like go sit outside in the sunshine or, or get in the bathtub or maybe pet the dog. That's, that's the closest care you have at that point. You kind of keep growing 
that list by taking some risk to do other things besides what we usually do. That old, the well-worn groove is like change the body, change the body game. The new groove would be maybe your first step is kind of give this five more seconds before I like track my calories mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or get in the car and go to CVS like I used to do and, you know, get like 10 pounds of candy. Um, you know, it's, can I be with this? Can I sit in the car five more minutes? And then you grow your capacity to like feel a little bit more, feel it not kill you, feel yourself, try the things and see what happens. And, and that's, what's different. I think that's the difference between when I see people that have been struggling a long time, there's not that part there for most people. They're just mm. kind of trying. And that's why I want to go back to is like, there's not enough safety build or capacity or window of tolerance for these sensations. Cause sometimes we don't have a name yet. We don't know how we feel or maybe we know how we feel, but the sensations feel so big and overwhelming that we don't have to do with it, you know? So I think that's the back and forth that so many people get into for a long time until they recognize, like, well, I've got to build some capacity in my system to feel this five more minutes, 10 more minutes, two more hours um, and see what happens. And a lot of times people just don't know that that's, that's something that needs to happen. If you just kind of look at, read the books or whatever, unless you hear people talk about this, then I think it's a game changer. Totally. Well, and I just keep thinking about all the things that trigger us as women. And it's like, for whatever reason, we think the only tool in our tool belt is to diet. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, I'm feeling like, for example, I remember over and over and over again, going into my closet and let's say I had an event coming up or I needed to find an outfit for this or find an outfit for that. And that was for me, I was experiencing such a level of social anxiety and discomfort Mm -hmm. that when I went into my closet and I started thinking about what I had to wear and then I was already not at a place where I could accept or love my body, then all of that anxiety that I felt about meeting new people and creating conversations Mm -hmm. with strangers and having to look a certain way or present myself in a certain way that I thought was acceptable or pleasing for my husband at the time as his wife and sort of what the role that I was supposed to play as a wife and feeling confusion around that. All of a sudden, all of that, because I couldn't sit with it, got translated to I hate Mm -hmm. myself and I hate my body and I have nothing to wear. And I would just start bawling. I mean, it was like every, Mm -hmm. almost every moment, my closet moment ended up in tears for me. And Mm -hmm. I really blamed it on my body. It was like I was giving all of that uncomfortable feeling and sort of blame and and transferring it onto my body. When in reality, I love what you're talking about, sort of giving ourselves the invitation to just have a little bit more tolerance. Like just sit with that anxiety just a few seconds longer, just a couple minutes longer. And I think what happens with that in my experience with anxiety in particular is that as you grow your tolerance for feeling anxiety, what you realize is you survive it and it doesn't kill you and it doesn't take over you. Even like a panic attack eventually goes away and it, the longer you can hold that and create the tolerance for it, it gives you confidence, but you can never get confidence when you sort of, interrupt this, the, the experience and throw the blame on the body and then start right. hyper controlling right. in some way. And I do want to mention everything you're describing is like the somatic process that, you know, that, okay, so you have these sensations and you, what your body does with like fight or flight, what, what with threat is the brain then goes, okay, got to make meaning of this. It's got to be about something. And if that's what we've been fed, that's the something, which is our body's wrong versus I don't even know if it will deeper than first. It's like the somatic memory is like all this buzzing, all this running, all this freaking out. And it goes up in your head. The body's the problem. And underneath all that, that running and that fear and that buzzing and that panic and dread and, was everything you mentioned, all that coupling of like who you thought you were supposed to be to be acceptable. And that's old stuff. It's just coming, coming up through like the 2000, whatever version of what you think of what's happening in your life right now. This is like old stuff. And now it's manifesting in that relationship outside yourself and with your body. So 
Yeah. Um, well, I joke it's that just, it's my, my 13 year old self is running the show. <laughs> oh, that's totally right. And if we, I think I, I know people don't always like, Oh, really? We're going to do that kind of work. But it's like, if we don't give that part, what it needed now, it, it's still, it's still going to try to run the show because it's scared. And it's like, this is my thing. Don't take away my thing. Right. Like being in the closet, freaking out about my body. This is the only way I know how to be. And unless we bring in like this competent adult to, and that's where I think the relation we people get better so much faster in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, what this conversation we're having right now, it's a lot easier to sit with anxiety when you have a grounded, like regulated, competent adult right beside you doing it, you get better so much faster versus I'm going to sit with my anxiety more. And we all have to do that. That's still our own work to do. But I know that like part of the reason it's not that again, that platform wasn't there in the first place because well, we don't do it that well for ourselves because we didn't have it on some level to begin with. Right. Well, we don't know what we don't know. So it's we don't know what we don't know. Exactly. Hard to yeah. walk yourself through it when you're not sure mm -hmm. what you're missing. Which That's is right. why That's right. That's right. you know, the work that you do is so amazing and such a gift to people. I mean, we were just talking a little bit about your practice and how you support your clients and walking them through this process, which we'll get into for everybody who's listening, ways in which you can connect with Tracy and with her programs and just, you know, even hiring her um, as a nutrition therapist as well and, and as an eating coach. But it's just, you know, for anybody who is on this journey, if there is somebody who can support you in this process, it's mm -hmm. so powerful. It's so helpful to have that partner. You know, I, you know, I, I was lucky enough. It's, it's interesting. You know, Mary knew where I grew up. It's like nowhere selling Illinois. And I was somehow like the one private practice dietitian that was around. She was, you know, this is a 20, this is again, 22 years ago. And somehow she had gotten a hold of some, I think there wasn't intuitive eating yet or anything, but there was a few little resources out there that she read and somehow she felt like this is the way she's going to deal with me. <laughs> And, uh, and it was game changing. And I thought that's how dietitians were. I didn't recognize when I went to school, Oh, we're supposed to give diets and stuff. Well, this isn't going to fly, but here I am. Um, you know, but, uh, I love that. you know, it's like, well, okay. I'm going to, I'm, by the time I finished my, my grad, my undergrad, I'm like, I guess I'm going to have to figure out how to be a different kind of dietitian or get a new, get a new career life because, you know, I, I got to do it the way I know that doesn't cause harm anyway. Um, so it, whether it's with me or Mary or somebody, it's really important, I think, and it just speeds, you know, this trust and this healing when somebody else can mirror back, like, yeah, you're anxious and I'm here with you. I've got you. You don't have to be different. Like mm. it's not bad. And that helps build that platform. One little brick after another of like, oh, I can be with anxiety and it's not going to kill me and I'm still okay. But I don't know. I just really encourage everybody who's listening to like do this kind of work with some kind of support, whether it's professional or not, just because it's a hard way to go on your own and, and it takes longer than it has to. Yes. I echo that on every, on every and, level. Yeah. I, like, I did a lot of it on my own. Cause I would like, you know, feel guilty for like, okay, I'm going to like work with this dietitian. Well, then I started feeling guilty about how much I was, and this was one of my core wounds of like, you know, having needs is too much. I'm like, I'm putting this resource into myself and I shouldn't need so much. And so I quit. And I had five years later, I'm like, Oh, I guess I need to go back to pick up where I left off essentially. Um, right. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's messy and not it's I mean, messy. Yeah. You've done it. I've done it. You know, we, we, it's possible to do. And anytime I ever talk about this, it's just, how can we make this a little bit easier and a little bit yes. more gentle? You know, even when I, yes. when I'm praying or when I'm meditating, I'm saying, you know, God, let it be easy, you know, let it be gentle. And anytime I say a prayer yeah. where I want to transform or I want to change something in my life, I always say, you know, let it be gentle, let it be easy. And I think that having somebody by your side is just a really kind way to be able to, to do that. And not that it's right for everybody. And sometimes right. you're in a place where you can, do that, but do that or, you know, but just even knowing 
there are people out there like you who are doing this work. And obviously you are a wealth of knowledge and people can connect with you on Facebook and on Instagram and on YouTube and can glean so much of your wisdom just by following those avenues. Um, and hopefully get to the place where they can hire, hire you or participate in one of your programs. I think it's just, there's a, there's a lot of avenues to feel supported. Um, and that support is available for sure. Um, kind of, kind of shifting and, and moving into sort of wrapping up and, and closing with our time. I'm just curious if, if there's anything from you, like if somebody is kind of in the middle part of this journey and it feels messy Mm -hmm. and they feel like they've, they they really want to be free of diet culture and they just can't seem to break free and they kind of keep coming back around to it. Is there any sort of last parting piece of wisdom that you might offer them on sort of something that they can do to, Mm -hmm. to shift that? What would you say? Well, I would, I would want them to get a little bit clear about what, what feels, um, yeah, what feels hard, what feels stuck, whether it's like, well, the food's pretty good, but it's the body image or, you know, I'm kind of okay with my body, but I can't let myself slow down first. Just bring some awareness so that that one piece and have compassion for it. Like you're not, going to undo all that wiring in three months, six months, one year, two years, whatever, have compassion for like, gosh, you've done so much already. If you're already even listening to this, I mean, that's brave in itself because it's rocking the boat for sure of a lot of stuff. Um, and know that like, well, you're already, you're, you're this far. I mean, there's a high probability you're going to get to the, the piece you'd like. Um, I guess this last parting thing is have a lot of compassion and, we're not really necessarily looking for um, I mean, it's great that you don't have any die thoughts ever again or any good food, bad food, or if that's even possible. The thing I think is really important is to be able to slow down and build a relationship like kind of more inly with yourself. So have tools to where, you know, like, man, nature really grounds me. Do that more often. Um, animals really ground me. Do that more often hot water bottles on my kidneys when I'm feeling really stressed. Gosh, that really helps me do that more often. And just give yourself the nurturance and the slowdown that you, that you really, really need, I think to build another little level of platform of like, okay, what's this last piece that like feels stuck or really scaring me. And there's probably a reason why that scares me. I wonder what that's about. Hmm. I mean, to me, and I, I love that you're kind of ending with this. To me, the answer is always more compassion for yeah. ourselves, just that deepening of love mm-hmm. and compassion. Um, Tracy, thank you so much. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface yeah. and could like <laughs> talk and talk and talk. And I know that people are going to be just so excited to follow you now. People that didn't know about you until today. This is like, yes, a new person. This is my people. So where is the best place for people to find you? Gosh, I do. I try to, yeah, provide a lot of support, um, you know, for free via uh, Facebook at Tracy Brown RD. And the same thing with YouTube, Tracy Brown RD, LD dash and you can find it just you can google it there um because i do a lot of videos just to give people like little 10 minute bursts of everything we're talking about today of all kinds of topics related to food body image um, self-care um really deepening the stuff because i know that y'all can read the intuitive eating book and get with the principles and stuff what i want to do is like how do you make those things stick and this is the kind of work that mary and i are talking about so you can find me there i have a website tracybrownrd.com and i blog um, but I'm a pretty can like, I like to interact with people kind of girl. So I do a lot more videos than writing. So if you want to find me, you, you can hear, see me yakking on Facebook. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, we will definitely link to all of your outlets so people can find you easily. So if you were listening to the podcast, you can check out all of Tracy's links below. And if you are watching the YouTube, it is obviously right below this video. You can check out the links below, but tracybrownrd.com. And again, thank you so much for being here today as our very special guest. And for those of you who are curious and want to learn more about Tracy, about what she is doing and working with with her. You can find all that information again on her site, tracybrownrd.com. Tracy, thank you so much. 
Mary, thank you for having me and everybody who's listening, watching. Um, thank you so much. You're doing such brave work. So just keep going and know that like we are cheering you on. Awesome. Thank you guys. We'll see you next week.